Mary, it's great to meet you. Thank you for talking to me today. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Mary, we sit here against the backdrop of GCF, the hubbub and the, the buzz is palpable in the room. Lots of energy, lots of conversation, lots of motivation to do more to build those cyber defences. Why are you here? Talk to me about your role in Remit with the Forum. Well, I was invited to speak at the opening session, which was a great honour. And what attracted me to come to Riyadh was when I looked at the programme and the agenda, I mean, I speak at cybersecurity conferences worldwide. And it's the first conference that had that breadth and depth of vision, I mean, from quantum computing to child safety in cyberspace. <laughs> what a leap. <laughs> and it's fantastic because I've been saying for about 20 years that in cyberspace, everything is connected. So we can't look at these issues in silos we've got to actually join the dots, see where the connections are. Mary, take me right back to the beginning. When and how or why was your interest first peaked in cyber psychology and how did that lead you on an academic and professional path? Sure, I mean, I first qualified in psychology back in the day, in the 80s. I came across the beginnings of the internet in the 90s and I was captivated. This was prior to social media prior to the internet as we know it now. And I thought about all the potential applications and then almost simultaneously, I thought, well, nothing in my qualifications to date equipped me to understand this stunning and pervasive and profound new technology. So I looked at the literature. In the late 90s, I came across the work of Professor John Suler and he's acknowledged as the father of cyber psychology, the founder. And I was lucky enough to meet him. I traveled to New York. I took a plane and a train and a bus <laughs> and met him on his campus at Ryder University in the US and was very lucky to be mentored by him. And I went back to requalify. I did a master's of science in cyber psychology, which is the study of the impact of technology on human behavior. And I did a PhD in forensic cyber psychology which is the study of criminal, deviant and abnormal behavior online. And I'm kept very busy. So that's led me to working in lots of different areas. At the moment, I am one of the leads on a very large uh, pan-European uh, research project under Horizon 2020, which is investigating human and technical drivers of cybercrime. So we're looking at pathways into cybercrime for young people and importantly, pathways out. And we'll be announcing our results soon. So that's a really interesting project. I also work as an academic advisor to law enforcement. So I'm the academic advisor to Europol, to the EC3, the Cybercrime Center. And I'm also a member of the Interpol Global Cybercrime uh, Expert Group. Apart from that, I work for industry. I'm a strategic advisor to Paladin, one of the largest venture capital companies in cyber in the US, and a company that is very interested in the whole area of not just cybersecurity, but online safety technology. What else do I do? I've worked in entertainment. The show CSI Cyber is actually based on me, on my work, and Patricia Arquette, the actor, actually played me in the television series. So I publish, involved in not-for-profits and of course here working on the professional speaking circuit. In 2004 Mary you were listed amongst the 100 top women in STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. Two years later you were named one of the top 50 most inspiring women in technology in Europe. We know that there is a woeful underrepresentation of women in the cybersecurity sector. So what would you say to young female graduates today who don't see themselves represented in the industry but are looking to forge a similar career path to you? Well, the astonishing news is that here in the Gulf, 46% of those who are qualifying in STEM and cybersecurity specifically are female. That's an incredible statistic. And you know, I get many people reaching out to me on social media, followers on LinkedIn or Twitter, and I get many young women asking my advice. You know, they say to me, as a woman working in this area, working in male-dominated uh, 
typically and traditionally male-dominated areas of law enforcement or computer science, you know, they ask me, well, how do you navigate that? How did you achieve, you know, the success that, that I have achieved? And they ask me, how did I do that as a woman? And my response is always, when I'm working, when I studied, when I did my exams, when I write my papers, when I present, I don't have a construct of gender. I only have a construct of performance. And my best advice to young women is, your gender is not your problem, it's somebody else's problem. Focus on performance, focus on personal best. There's a great quote, quote by Faulkner, which is, never compete with your predecessors, never compete with your contemporaries. The only person you have to compete with is yourself. And this has served me well. In terms of the intersection between technology and human behaviour, where does it overlap? And technology is so often regarded as the antithesis to humanity. I think we're at a point where there's a gap in the knowledge in terms of the impact of technology on humankind on the individual in terms of psychology and the group in terms of sociology. I think that there are certain paradigm shifts that have to be conceptualized when we think about an age of technology. And the first paradigm shift is to conceptualize cyberspace as an environment, so as a place. And for for many years I've been talking about cyberspace as a domain, as an environment. Only recently, it was 2016 I believe, that NATO ratified cyberspace as a domain, acknowledging that the battles of the future would take place on land, sea, air and on, uh, on, on computer networks. Conceptually, the military have conceived cyberspace as having three layers. You've got the physical layer, which is the hardware, the infrastructure. You have the network layer, which is the connectivity. And then you have what's described by the military as the cyber persona layer. That's us, the humans. <laughs> and I think that this is the area that has been least studied. But what's really heartening for me is I see this growing interest in factoring the human into the cybersecurity equation. And the fact that I was invited here to give a keynote, I think is an exemplification of that. I'm delighted with the vision that has been presented here at the GCF to actually rethink the global cyber order. And part of that rethinking has to be factoring in those who are vulnerable online. And children are particularly vulnerable in cyber contexts. Of the children involved in the darker side of cyber, how do they become embroiled in that world in the first place and how do they untangle themselves for it? Moreover, what can the parents do to be aware? I think, first of all, it's very difficult for parents to know when their children are doing something that they should not do online. For example, we see evidence from a law enforcement perspective of very young children going to places like dark nets on the dark web which is, is a very dangerous environment. And I think sometimes parents can have a false sense of security where they think my child is upstairs in their bedroom, but where are they? They may be exploring parts of cyberspace that are very risky. And that's why at a governmental level, at a duty of care level, we have to ensure that cyberspace is safe for children. We have to ensure that they can maximize their engagement with technology, get all the benefits, explore safer parts of the web. The problem with the internet is there is no shallow end of the swimming pool. <laughs> so, so you know, in my country where I'm from, in Ireland, we say it takes a village to raise a child. This is also true in cyberspace. With a specific focus on juvenile cyber delinquency, what can you tell us about the trends that you're identifying so far? Yes, well, what we see and our research results are 
just will be published soon, but what we've seen is of our sample of 8,000 young people Europe-wide, the majority of that group had actually engaged in some form of what we call cyber juvenile delinquency, which is risk-taking or problematic behaviour, all the way through to cybercrime. So that's a, a huge percentage, and I think it's something that we need to pay attention to. So our research will actually identify evidence-based points of intervention. And I think it's exciting to do cutting edge research, but it'll be even more exciting to see our findings put into practice. Do you think that the findings will be a surprise to anybody outside of the industry? Me personally, no. <laughs> but I think it might surprise a lot of people who are, who are you know, bystanders in cyberspace. And I think part of the problem is that we've had 50 years 60 years of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity protects data, systems, and networks. It does not protect what it is to be human online. Your data is never going to suffer from low self esteem. Your data is never going to feel the need for revenge. So, the exciting thing is, we've seen the evolution of this whole new sector which is the online safety technology sector. And this very much started with the work in the UK where the online safety bill, effectively there was a conceptualization of a spectrum of online harm, ranging from cyberbullying through to harassment, to mis- and disinformation, cyber fraud to cyber criminality. And problematic, harmful and criminal behaviors in cyberspace have the characteristics of big data, volume, velocity, variety. And therefore we need AI and ML solutions to these problems. We want our systems to be robust, resilient and secure, but we also need the humans who operate and use those systems to be psychologically robust, resilient, safe and secure. And we've just published research in the US, which was um, sponsored by uh, industry, which was the Paladin Safety Tech Report. And the great news is that we found evidence of an emerging billion dollar sector in the US dedicated to innovating technology solutions to technology facilitated problems. I'm very excited about it. We published the report in January. By February, we got a call from the White House to brief them on the results. So people are paying attention. This is good news. You say that people want to make a difference. People arguably want to make a difference, but are they putting their money where their mouth is? Are they investing? <laughs> well, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> and that's why I was so happy that a VC would be interested in this space. And I know a couple of, of uh, organizations are beginning to get very interested in investing in safety tech solutions. Here at the conference, we're talking about this joined up approach. We're talking about bringing all these issues together. But effectively, safety tech can deliver on that. What we could do, and I really hope it's an outcome of this conference, that we actually end up with the development of a whole new sector in cyberspace. A sector dedicated to developing safer and more secure society. And I think that what that will do is it drives innovation when you create a new sector, it builds business, it creates jobs, and this sector could provide solutions to complex socio-tech problems. It sounds so much needed. We do hope that you will be the chairwoman of this new sector, of course. Absolutely, I will volunteer my services. For me, it's a, it's a, it's a vision, it's a mission, it's a passion. Many might say that it's arguably the government's responsibility first to protect their citizens and really reinforce that national cyber security defence line. Um, are there infrastructures up to snuff? And do governments need to constantly upgrade these systems given how fast technology is going? I think there's a lot of collaboration because we're all living in this shared space, in cyberspace. 
uh, Chris English, who's the national, uh, the US national cyber director, he said recently that we're all connected in cyberspace. Therefore, each of us must participate in the defense of all of us. I like this. I think that when we neglect children and young people, what we're really doing in cybersecurity terms is potentially creating an attack vector, allowing entities to tap into their psychological Achilles heel. And I think young people, youth are our greatest resource. This is true here in the Gulf, it's also true worldwide. I think when you look at technical solutions, those solutions are uniform because everybody's speaking the same language of cybersecurity. What I like about safety tech or online safety technology is that it is culturally specific. So safety tech in the UK will be different to safety tech in the US, will be different to safety tech in Europe, will be different to safety tech in the Gulf. And I think ultimately when we talk about this uh, living together in cyberspace, yes, from a technical perspective, but we also as nations, as states, want to be able to maintain cultural identity. And safety tech can do that. You can decide what is culturally appropriate, what is age appropriate in each culture, and how do you design a cyberspace that resonates with, with your cultural aspirations. Mary, you work with a huge amount of policy makers right around the world. Talk to me about the, the cultural or political diplomatic differences with dealing with different countries. What is their level of receptiveness to change? I, I actually have found that, that nearly everywhere I travel, governments are receptive to listening uh, to solutions because nobody wants to see their citizens harmed in any way. And I think that when you offer solutions that, that, that can help solve these complex problems, then a government is always going to be willing to listen. Mary, you know better than anyone the, the state of mind of a cyber criminal. You know the darkest side of the cyber world. What keeps you awake at night? What do you know that we don't, which concerns you the most? I think what keeps me awake at night is worrying about the topography of the internet. So what does that mean? We have the surface web that we're all familiar with, but then we have the deep web. And in the deep web, we have the dark web, and then we have dark nets. And these are the sort of, you know, uh, criminal meeting places, what, what, uh, what's called offender convergence settings. And what keeps me awake is that this is what's driving cyber criminality. If we take, for example, crime as a service, at a certain point, up to quite recently, you had to have some technical ability to engage in cybercrime. Now you don't. The barrier to entry to engage in cybercrime has been lowered. You can go to these domains, you can buy an exploit, you can rent an exploit, or you can hire somebody to deploy it for you. And that's what keeps me awake at night because what that means is that if we do not tackle these dark parts of the net, we will face a tsunami of cyber criminality going forward. We will face an e-pandemic. And that's where we have to leave it, but thank you again for talking to me today. Thank you for the questions, I enjoyed it.